But let me just get the other Doug. <clears throat> well, his mic's gonna take a while. I'll circle back around. All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? A short attendee list today. Uh, let's see. Do, do, do community time. All right, any community related topics we want to bring up? Things that are not on the agenda, mainly from newcomers. All right, nothing. That's good. All right, um, SDK. We did not have an SDK meeting today because we had no topics, so nothing new there. Um, okay, so. Uh, Go Lang 07 just shipped. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott, say that again. The Golang SDK 070 just shipped. Ooh, cool. Excellent. Any questions about that? All right, moving forward then. So uh, hopefully everybody knows we are gonna do a demo for the uh, for KubeCon in less than two weeks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we only have, as of right now, I think for sure there are two participants, uh, Scott and myself. I think Jude is working on an implementation. I think Varun slash Oracle, you guys might be working on one as well. I'm not 100% sure, but just uh, a reminder. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Although um, I have a lot of questions <laughs> okay. about it. Okay, <laughs> well, we do a phone call right after this one where we talk about everything related to KubeCon, whether it's the demo or the presentation. So feel free to join that one. Um, the biggest thing is for everybody else, if you want your company to be part of this demo, you, you got to start coding now because this one is bigger than the previous ones. So it will take some time to get it just right. So don't wait to the last minute if you want to join. Just a, a reminder, you, you, you've all been warned. Um, so let's see what else. Okay, so KubeCon itself. Um, as I mentioned, we do have a meeting right after this one to talk about anything related to the KubeCon. Um, I know some people have been working on their slides. I don't, I could be wrong, but I don't believe anybody's slide deck is actually completed yet. Um, I believe the official deadline was like already passed. Uh, so technically we're all late, um, but at least we're all in the same boat together. What I'd like to do is to pressure everybody to get their slides done no later than next week's phone call, so next Thursday, so that at least this working group can uh, look at the slides and, and have comments in time for the KubeCon the following week. So everybody on the call who's working on slides, please try to get your stuff in there sooner rather than later, but no later than like Wednesday night next week if possible, okay? All right, any questions about KubeCon or the demo that are appropriate for here as opposed to the meeting in one hour? Okay, moving forward then. KubeCon China. Um, Kathy and I talked a little, and Kathy is gonna be there. So as of right now, Kathy and I will be doing some presentations. There are two 35 minute ones, one for cloud event, and one for uh, serverless. If you are going to be there and you would like to be part of those presentations, just let us know. Otherwise, Kathy and I can handle it. It's only 35 minutes each, but the more the merrier if you guys want to join. Um, let's see what else. Okay, so I was supposed to present the cloud events status on the uh, CNCF TOC call this Tuesday. Unfortunately, they ran out of time, so I got bumped to next Tuesday's call. However, I did actually finish the presentation, so the link is right here. If you guys want to look it over, and if you have any last minute comments or suggestions for edits, uh, just let me know and I'll try to get them incorporated. Um, a couple people did some reviews. I think Mark was the biggest one I did review and made some changes based upon that. Um, but so I think it's pretty much good to go. It's not terribly exciting, just a summary of what we've been doing. Um, so obviously since we did not have that phone call or we didn't talk about cloud events, I still don't have any resolution on what three independent end users means yet, but they did agree to talk about that on the call. So hopefully we'll get that soon. All right, any other topics before we jump into PR stuff? All right, cool, moving forward then. Klaus, I believe you're on the call. Would you like to quickly talk to this relatively easy one? Okay. Oh, that was just, uh, I just added this um, link and the um, document that describes all the existing documented extensions. And uh, I realized when, when working on my slides that the link to the data ref extension was missing. So that's all. Yep. Very straightforward. Any questions or concerns on this one? All right, I figured that would be easy. Get the one out of the way. Thank you, Klaus, for noticing that. All right, next one. Um, Alan 
is not on the phone call, so I don't think there's anything really to discuss on this one. Um, for those of you who were not on the call early, uh, Clement said he's actually going to possibly run into Alan next week at a face to face meeting. So he will poke him on that to try to get his opinion on that one and possibly even join our phone call next week. So what I'd like to suggest is that we hold off until that time to see if we can get Alan to speak up to see if they can sway our opinion. Otherwise, we will close that issue or that PR with no action. Is that okay? Waiting one more week then? Is everybody? All right, I hear any complaints. So let me make a note here, otherwise I'll forget. All right, thank you. All right, um, all right. Heinz is on the call, excellent, cool. So let's see if we can revisit this issue, which is the uh, event key stuff. Um, Heinz and Clemens, maybe one of you two guys can summarize kind of where we are in the latest round of concerns, and Clemens, maybe that you can then talk about your proposal for how to, res how to resolve this going forward. Um, yeah, I've been listening to Heinz, uh, um, speak on this very entertaining uh, call from a few, couple of weeks ago. Um, and I think there's, so I agree that Heinz is, is right, that it's superfluous um, as an artifact if you um, just look at the message and then decide your partitioning strategy from the message. So either you know, passing that as a parameter to uh, the Kafka API um, or um, even making a call uh, for the partition choice directly. So I basically with the Kafka API, you can um, either pick a key or you can even go in and send directly to a partition. And the same is true for um, the API, for instance, that we have for event ops. Um, so for that, there's no need to have that key inside of the message. And, and of course, if you have the message and you look at it, you can go and take you know, you can synthesize a key from any material that's uh, in the message. And um, you can, so you can basically just pick a natural key that's there um, without needing to have that extra element. Um, at the same time, the counter argument that I heard on the call was mostly one of simplicity and one of um, um, effectively, you have to have that in the Kafka API. So why not have, have a, and you know, why not have a extension that creates an artificial key? Um, and then the discussion went back and forth for a while. Um, and I think um, we can actually have both. Um, I would, and, and that's what the proposal is. Um, and that is the, the Kafka binding and, and any binding that's using, that's requiring partitioning should mandate that there is a, some form of a callback um, that allows the application uh, that basically goes from the binding, whatever the transport uh, mechanism is, um, allows the application to go and take a look at the message. The application will know um, what the schema is. It will have full visibility into, into the message itself. And then ask that callback, basically ask the message, ask the application to either create a partition key, or we could also have a, a mechanism that allows the, um, that callback to determine the partition outright. Um, that's really up to you know, how the Kafka binding uh, or an, a future per, potentially event up binding might want to do that. Um, but then I don't think it hurts to have the partition key as an extension as we have it right now, um, which is effectively becoming the default choice for that mechanism if present. So you can add the partition key if you want to um, using that extension. The Kafka binding, if you don't register the callback, the Kafka binding will then go and look for um, that partition key, that partition key extension. And if that's not present, it will just you know, make up a random key and then um, it gets you know, effectively randomly distributed into partition. So I think we can have both. And uh, it doesn't hurt to have that, to have the partition key mechanism. All right. Uh Jim, your hand is up, and then I'd like to pick on Heinz, if that's okay, Heinz. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> Jim, you're first. Uh, just a quick one. Um, that sounds really good. I, I haven't read this. I, I just want to understand um, who wins. Is it the 
uh, provider that's plugged into the SDK or the extension in the cloud event? I would, I would say the, the callback overrides. So effectively, when you have the callback, the callback has the option to go and take a look at the extension and that's kind of the, the default implementation. But then, um, you know, whatever the callback returns as the partition key um, uh, or partition ID, if you want to have this two, um, is then what is what actually counts. Cool. Okay. And, and we would make this what a, a suggested pattern for any transport that wants partitioning support. Yeah. So yeah, that's how I'll see it. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Okay. So Heinz, I'd like to get your take on, on all this. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, uh, Again, part of it is more of a philosophical uh, uh, issue as opposed to some hard and fast uh, rule here where normally when you have these separations, you try and keep them clean. So uh, from my perspective, the, the API, or sorry, <clears throat> the uh, definition of the specification for what an event should look like should not have direct dependencies necessarily on the binding or the API. Um, I agree it might make it easier to build the binding or the API, but uh, it opens the floodgates then of, I want to make my binding, if I uh, start to allow third parties to have their own supported uh, bindings, uh, or, you know, if they have large uh, environments, such as maybe an IBM MQ environment, where uh, they might say, well, I want things put into that standard as well. Um, which really are not part of the event. They're really part of either the transport, which the binding takes care of, or the API. And in fact, the point that uh, I was trying to make is very similar to uh, what Clemens had mentioned, which is I would actually see this maybe not even at the binding, but almost at the uh, API level where you should have some kind of pre and post processor uh, whenever you receive a message or wherever you send one, for exactly that reason, there are all kinds of things I may want to do based on that event data, and that includes the uh, uh, payload data within that event that may be binder or transport or API specific, and it might be better to implement them there just to keep the layers pure and clean. I don't know if that makes sense. It certainly does make sense to me, and that's so. That's effectively the mechanism I'm proposing. It's 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 an API level callback mechanism that basically is and it's mandated, which then yields control back to the application. Then then say, okay, so you give me that message. Now go and pick out you know what the right partition key is because it turns out I need to have a partition key for this transport. So that's 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 in that spirit. The reason why I think why I think it's not hurting to have the partition key as a generic um, uh, extension is that the problem is not constrained to Kafka, and there are plenty of reasons. That, and so, for instance, we have we have in in Service Bus uh, in um, in Azure, um, we also have a partition key concept for queues because we have um, queues that for reliability and throughput reasons, we go and shard um, the content across um, up to 16 sub queues. And to make sure that all the messages stay together that should belong together and for you to have a little bit of control, you can also set a partition key. And it basically just means that they are all the messages that you think belong together by some, by some means, um, um, uh, are stuck into the same partition so that they preserve order. Um, so it's a it's not a pattern that's exclusive to Kafka, but it's basically everything that has a has some kind of a partitioning model needs to have a hint, and that hint is something that the application cares about, and that's why uh, I think for the case where you know that you are dealing with a partitioned entity that you sent to, so you basically you want to formulate a cloud event. You want to use the, the the standard SDK, and then you send to um, to the particular entity using um, so to the, the you know, Kafka topic or to the service bus queue. You want to use you want to send to that using the our our SDKs. 
um, it would be very convenient for you to have this a common mechanism to kind of, from the application perspective, give that hint. And then how that hint is really applied is then a function of the of the binding. So the, you could always go and overwrite that partition. You can set it, but then if your if your partitioning strategy is different, or if it even changes, um, then the binding has the opportunity to go and say, okay, that's fine that you gave me that hint, but I'm actually going to do diff that differently now. So that's the the idea. I, I don't think the partition key hurts because I we also have that in our we also have that in our APIs. So, um, Tapini, I think your hand was up first. Oh. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, I wanted to point out that, yes, it does, Heinz, what you said, it does make sense that, uh, for example, individual transfer binding shouldn't, uh, they shouldn't be able to demand uh, particular things from the overall main spec. But this is not in the overall main spec. This is an extension, and I think the best way to, uh, or one example of why that as an extension is uh, useful is that if you w were to send your cloud event, for example, over HTTP to some entity that you know will partition it later on, um, if you only have a callback mechanism in the SDK or API or something, uh, you would need a <laughs> you would need a third party extension to indicate that within the cloud events um, over the HTTP binding. And then why would you not have a well known extension for that, which would be standard? That's just my point of this being an extension which doesn't mandate what the SDKs do. It's the individual bindings could just as well specify their own third party extensions. Kafka could, the Kafka binding could specify a, another third party extension which it uses for this. But I think it's better because it's such a common concept as Clemens pointed out uh, to have it as a generic well-known extension. Okay, Heinz, I think your hand's next. Um, for, I, I agree from the perspective of an extension, absolutely. But again, it goes back to you know, this concept of the different layers with this separation of church and state. Um, and again, I believe that having that is kind of a redundant, where if I am going to create it, and regardless if it's Kafka, if, if I'm creating that key uh, to do this partitioning, that key is going to be based on something that's in the data that I already have. If that is uh, the case, um, then if I already have that data captured in the event when it's passed to the layer below, my plugin or pre or post processing, however you want to implement it or even have it as part of the binding, will also have that same data. So why do I have to create it before I send it where it's part of that same data? You know, it, it's kind of like if you look at the uh, uh, JMS spec, one thing I've always hated is the fact that if I wanted to do a selector, I had to take data that was already in the payload of my message and duplicate that in the header just to be able to do the selector because that's how they decided to implement the binding layer a little farther down. And I'm trying to avoid that where, again, things will start to sneak in where if it's in the data, if it's created from the data, it should be done at a lower layer. If it's mandatory for a lower layer to work, uh, then I could see that. If it's an extension that you want to do as a, you know, almost like a user specific extension where you want to do it for your application, you know, does it need to be a documented extension? Make sense? So my hands up first and then to I'll go to you. Um, so clarifying question for then for you, Heinz. Um, that, that lower layer though, that's gonna extract the data or the, the, the bits from the data to generate the key, um, it would then have to understand the payload, right? It would have to understand the data, the format, the schema, whatever you wanna call it, to be able to extract the appropriate data. And on, or the other option is, I think what Clemens was suggesting is where there's a, a callback mechanism, right? So in my mind, whether there's a callback mechanism so that transport there can be independent of the data or whether the application gives you the key up front through some extension is there really much of a difference in your mind 
Uh, well, you're adding something into the event definition for processing at the next level. And I agree it makes it easier to process at the next level, but that also means now rather than doing it once in the binding layer, you're going to have to do it for every message that you send using that event. And that's, you know, really not that efficient. And you're putting dependencies now into your application as opposed to extracting them at the binding layer. So for example, if I'm generating a key uh, for example, a Kafka partition, that key is based on something in the data. I mean, it's not just some random number or a sequence or something. Mm -hmm. And it can also be quite complex because Kafka has done a great job of making that key an object. So it could actually be multiple pieces of data. Um, so if it's being done over and over the same time, it should be done at the transport or the callback where I plug it in once, as opposed to doing it in every event message, sticking it into the event spec somewhere in the event specification to pass it to the lower layer. So, you know, it becomes inefficient. You're passing lower level processing back into the event and, you know, you're kind of uh, destroying the shielding. You know, it's kind of like the concept of something like Spring Cloud Streams, where I completely abstract it out. Everything is done on annotations and configuration files that all get put together at runtime, as opposed to I have to run it in every application. But if you do have to implement it, I totally agree. It should be an extension as opposed to part of the spec. Okay. Uh, Tapini, I think you're next. Uh, yeah, sure. I, I agree on, on abstract level what you're talking about, Heinz, but I disagree about that being the only viewpoint or the only use usage viewpoint for cloud events as a spec. Um, <clears throat> if you are implementing a higher level API that handles events and you know you will be partitioning those later on and your users know you will, will be partitioning those later on, there is no generic callback mechanism we can specify that would work because if you get those events over HTTP, <laughs> we're not going to start specifying HTTP callbacks in our spec. So the the uh, situation then becomes that if you're building a higher level uh, API that takes cloud events and then knows it will be partitioning those, you will have to define your own uh, mechanism of getting that key because you cannot let the consumer decide it in the callback because they don't have access to that callback. And that, that might well be a use case for cloud events. And that's why I disagree that it isn't useful to document it in a well-known extension as an extension. Okay. Um, I think Evan, I think you're next. Um, <clears throat> I guess the one thing that's not clear to me here, and I think, um, I think we've danced around this a little in the discussion is, um, the partition key is basically the producer having an opinion about how this maps in terms of a grouping to the destination. Um, when we're talking about extracting attributes from the payload, um, that sounds like it's closer to the consumer deciding how the partitioning happens and potentially different consumers might make different partitioning choices. So if we think that it's likely that different consumers will end up wanting to partition different ways. I know Clemens has some good examples um, from IoT spaces of, you know, type of sensor, uh, building, and so forth that you might want to partition differently. Then it's like having this documented um, probably doesn't match most consumers' needs. The, the callback idea was, was also on the consumer side. Uh, sorry, on the publisher side. So the publisher writes writes a um, writes an event and then the callback is also basically the call it, 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 the, you don't know where that event goes as you produce it and then you send that off to one of the chosen transports that is configured underneath you and if the chosen transport happens to be kafka there's a callback hook that comes back up into your app and then that says you know okay you give me this event now give me a partition key that was the idea so it's not the consumer the consumer is not in, in play here yeah, I mean, it's consumer specific how you want to partition or, or the consumer is does care about how you partition your events, but the consumer unfortunately cannot decide that. And it makes no sense to specify an extension that does that because no yeah. transport we know of does that. 
because it's but, not very efficient or useful. It's an out of band communication that you need for that. But th this, so that the implementation of that callback would be effectively specific to that particular Kafka topic that you're sending to. So you have the, the particular Kafka topic has a particular partitioning strategy and you're writing a callback function that just, that serves that particular partitioning strategy, looking back at that message. That's the idea of that callback. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out where we are here. Um, Cause I'm not sure I'm hearing anything that's a whole lot new from people and I don't want to keep circling. Um, Heinz, uh, let me pick on you. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so I, I gained the sense that you, you clearly don't, if it was solely up to you, you clearly would not put this in there. I, I get that. Uh, but what I'm trying to figure out is whether you could live with this because what I'm, and I'm not an expert in this space, but what I'm struggling with is that I'm hearing from the people who created the Kafka binding that they are blocked without this. And that's the, and that's the biggest thing that's running through my mind in terms of whether we need this or not and, and, and should put it in there at least to, to satisfy them because they seem to believe they actually fully need this to make progress. Um, I'm trying to, I'm trying to re resolve that with this, with all the good points you've made about it's not necessary, right? So I'm trying to resolve those two. They seem to be in conflict. Well, uh, unfortunately you have me at a disadvantage because I haven't really looked at the Kafka binding that was implemented. However, having written uh, several connectors uh, against Kafka in and out of other third-party messaging systems, um, this was a topic that you've seen come up quite often. And we've usually figured out how to solve the problem without having to front load uh, dependencies into the uh, other third parties. And you actually implement those at the binding layer, which in this case was a connector layer. The, uh, uh, so it, it almost sounds like we've kind of painted ourselves into a corner and now we need to add this in rather than perhaps revisiting the uh, binder. The other part, which Clemens made the excellent point of as well, is this is coming up for partitions. What's going to come up when there's other dependencies that would make it easier for bindings um, or the API definitions without a standard mechanism to plug these things in to solve it at a lower layer? You're going to just keep coming back to this to make it easier for the underlying layers. And I'm not against making things easy, don't get me wrong, but at the same time, you know, if you start to make things easy, it opens the floodgates of all kinds of other things that people want to add. However, if you want to add it as an extension, that's one thing, but then the extension question becomes, well, it's not just the key. I also have to know the topic. I may have to know the key. It may have to be different keys depending on different things. Is it an object? Is it a string? Is it a binary now? Because it, you know, I mean, even if you accept that you're going to pass something as a key, what is that key because of the flexibility within Kafka in itself is going to open another can of worms as well. Does that make sense? Kind of, but Clemens, you raised your hand. Did you want to respond to that? Uh, no, that was, the hand was left, left up. Oh, darn. <laughs> okay. Um, so just to be very clear, the, the Kafka binding that we're talking about <clears throat> is just a specification at the, our proposal for spec. It's not actually a formal spec in our, in our working group yet, and it's definitely not implemented as far as I know. Um, so it's not like it's set in stone. Uh, Tapini, I think your hand's up. Uh, yeah, I just want to point out that although this does allow th those that binding and other stuff to move forward, uh, and I think it works well as the lowest common common denominator to the flat case you were talking about, Heinz, which I agree about. We shouldn't document every single thing everybody wants as a well-known extension. They should define their own extensions, but I think this is widespread enough. But um, I, I do think that we should Im implement the lower level uh, hooks or whatever you were talking about, callbacks. Heinz and Clemens have been suggesting because I think that is also important for other kinds of things in bindings and yeah, I, I think that definitely should be added as an as an issue. Oh, I'm not sure I understood what you're saying. It's been. It sounds like you're saying you, you definitely think that the Kafka PR 
uh, spec PR should be augmented to include a callback, right? Uh, I, I I know I I'm saying they should unblock them, but we should be talking about what that low level callback looks like that Heinz and Clemens have suggested. Okay, so so you are in favor of this PR as a stance. Yes. Right. Okay. So Heinz, it, let me ask a, another question. Of you. Would it be horrible in your mind if we were to accept this as an extension for right now, with the assumption that we can revisit this later based upon the, the next round of PRs, which is going to be the Kafka PR, and see whether you can maybe convince them that they did not need this after all. At that point, we can always remove it since it's just an extension. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just bringing up the issues at this point to uh, hopefully make sure they don't come up later on. Uh, the fact that it is an extension, um, again, is not such a bad thing. But if we're going to do it, I'm just looking at maybe something a little more generic that can be reused downstream by things such as callbacks or, uh, you know, uh, you know, dynamic uh, loaded classes and these kind of things, as opposed to doing it specific for just Kafka. Right. So, but again, um, you know, I'm opposed to it, but I'm not going to, you know, go uh, go apoplectic if it uh, continues <laughs> farther on. Well, that's good. We don't want to send you to a seizure. Exactly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, because one of the things we always did talk about in the past when it comes to extensions is that it is um, not just a way for people to, to go beyond what we define the spec <clears throat> for their own particular need, but also as a bit of a playground to see whether something that sounds like an interesting idea that actually is worthy enough to maybe at some point make it into the spec or worthy enough to be a common thing that enough people in the community want, even though the spec itself doesn't have it. And this counts, kind of feels like it's in that experimental stage. Um, that's why I'm kind of inclined to maybe push us a little to say, let's add it since it is just an extension, which means it's you know, even more optional than optional stuff in the spec, um, just to see what happens with the Kafka binding. And that way we can always revisit it later. But Jim, I see your hand is up. Yeah, and, I, and I'm probably gonna vehemently agree with everybody else. I mean, um, the extension is, is a nice to have, but I don't think it should stop um, the Kafka binding from moving forward. Um, that I think what we're really saying is that, uh, as Clements described, what we're really saying is that if you're writing a, an SDK, that you know in some situations you're going to have to call back into an application to get some extra information, whether that's a partitioning key or a, a destination topic on whatever your transport is or whatever. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that the people that are working on the Kafka spec don't require this extension to be present for their transport binding to work. That's my only comment. Okay, I think we may have to go back to circle with, around to them and see if that is something they could live with or not. So <clears throat> with that in mind, let me put forward a proposal and see what happens. So my proposal would be to, one, open up another issue to add more examples to here, because I think several people, including Tapini and Kathy, have asked for more examples. Uh, except I don't think that should necessarily block the PR from going in. Two, an action item to open an issue so we revisit whether this extension is still actually necessary after we resolve the Kafka PR. And then three, ask the guys who are writing the Kafka binding PR to strongly consider whether they really need this or not. And, and Heinz would like you to join in that conversation. Yes, no worries. So what do people think about that? Let me actually write it down for a sec. That sounds very good, Doug. Okay, I'm glad you like that. So let's see if I can actually remember what I said. Um, <laughs> sounds good, but um, I also wanted to uh, point out there was a great, great, great thing you said there, uh, where someone said, we should strongly, uh, strongly suggest to binding and SDK and whatever authors um, to not require extensions. Yeah, that was uh, I think think Jem that made that, yeah. Oh yeah, Jem or someone, but yeah, I, I think that's a great snippet that should be in the primer or somewhere. Don't require extensions for your thing to work unless it's actually like must have. Okay, um, so I'm gonna pick on Heinz here. So I'm taking the other ones. Uh, oops. <laughs> um, 
Okay. <laughs> uh, so I, this is basically the proposal, these three lines right here, uh, in addition to accepting the PR. What do people think about that? If you guys can read that, I know sometimes the highlighting is hard to read. Jim, I assume your hand up is old. Oops. Okay, that's fine. Just a second. Any comments, questions about the proposal? Okay, is there any objection to moving forward with this proposal? So to be clear, this will accept this PR as it stands right now. And then we'll open up these other action items. Going once. Done. I appreciate you guys' uh, efforts on this and especially the flexibility here. All right. Um, why is this here? That's just weird. Okay, another exciting one. <laughs> Quotes for attributes in HTTP, in particular strings. So, I'm trying to remember where we left off on this one. Um, Scott, uh, do you mind if I pick on you to try to summarize where we might be on this one? Uh, I think the last comment is something about the uh HTTP binding transport or uh, the binding spec to not wag the entire cloud events spec. <laughs> That's right. I wag the dog comment. I thought that was good. Um, okay. However, I'm not, while the comment is funny, I'm not sure where that leaves us in terms of proposals going forward. Um, Uh, should Jim, I, go ahead. Should I speak up since I wrote that sarcastic comment. Um, it, I guess where I was coming from was um, it just seemed a bit weird to me that we had a transport binding that worked as far as I was aware. Um, but because, you know, it didn't, you know, follow sort of convention of HTTP that we were using that as a rationale to then go back and change um, the type system, um, and then subsequently, I guess, change all the other bindings to comply with that. So I, I'm not adverse to changing the type system if, if that's what we want to do, um, but I, I think that would be a better first step um, and then change all the bindings to match that type system rather than the other way around. That, that's really what I was trying to drive at. Um, Hopefully, people. Yeah. So, Scott, I, I don't don't both. take that the wrong way. But you, no, you I did both in this. Gym, yeah. So you could pretend I did it the first way, where I changed the type system and then I changed the bindings. Oh, just a point of clarity there, Jim. Um, you are correct that technically the HTTP binding spec that we had technically worked. The problem is no one actually implemented it. Everybody pretty much ignored it, and so that's that why we came to this problem. Okay. No, I get that. But I mean, is that a spec issue or an implementation issue? I guess, yeah, okay. But yeah. Yeah, that, that aside, um, do we, are, we, are we really voting here on saying, putting a restriction that all context attributes must be strings with some you know, defined format um, and doing away with numbers and, and anything like that? that? That's the bottom line. Um. Clements, I heard you sign back there. Did you want to say something? Well, the, 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 as I wrote, the idea was to basically go use JSON's um, type system, which means the way how it encodes types, um, which yields strings, and um, then do the encoding that way, which works for HTTP and then works for other transports that are constrained to strings in their headers. Um, and so that was the, that was the, that was the basic idea. And what we, we, since a string in JSON is encoded with quotes, um, you can't just omit the quotes and then still, and then claim that you still have JSON, which means you can either have it, um, you can either say, okay, we are not going to encode in JSON. We're going to encode strings. 
Um, and then everything that is a string will have to go and further subdivide. And then if we want to have integers, we basically have to go and refer to a rule, which might be the JSON rule for how to go and encode that, um, that integer. And uh, we're, we'll be losing, uh, but with that, we'll be losing inference because our signal for whether something is a string, that's the leading uh, quote, that's no longer there which means like you can't tell 41751 um, as a number from 41751 as a string. And so there's a, there's a, we can go and restructure this and I don't think it's gonna be, um, I mean, it's work to go and restructure this. So, but effectively what that means is that we have to change the type system such that if we care about having numerals, if we care about having, uh, um, uh, timestamps, um, if we care about having your eyes, we need to retain some sort of a type system because we want to have common definitions for this. Well, certainly we, we don't want to have for, you know, in all the places where we have your eyes, we don't want to repeat that encoding. So there's got to be a common place. You have to go and point to that. And so now the question is whether we really need to have our own type system rather than um, borrowing the one from, from Jason. So I th I, for me personally, that's more an implementation issue than anything else. And one that is more cosmetic than anything else. Um, but I'm, this is one thing where I'm like, uh, I'm not willing to ha have to fight a hard fight. I, I'm okay with wherever that falls in the majority opinion. I just find J J rather than building, building, building our own parsers and our own encoders, I find Jason um, being pretty convenient. All right, um, my hands up. So the way I kind of looked at this, and I put this into my comment here, um, I kind of view this as two different options in front of us. Um, and I know this this may feel like letting HTTP tail wag our dog, but unfortunately, I do think HTTP is a is a huge player in all this. And I and it as as odd as it may be, I'm okay letting it kind of wag us a little. Um, I kind of view this as two options. One is make everything a string. Um, we, for a long time, have talked about how cloud events should be, you know, minimal things to add to the event. This isn't meant to duplicate everything that's in the data stuff. It's just meant to help, you know, route things or get us to a destination. And we always talk about keeping it small, lightweight. And I think forcing everything to be a string would help ensure that happens because when you have a full-blown type system then it kind of encourages people to put possibly lots more data in there than they would maybe normally I, I, I'm not sure maybe um, plus the fact that up till now pretty much everything we define is a string except for I think one attribute which is an integer tells me that maybe we wouldn't be losing a whole lot if we did to say everything's a string and just be done with it but so that's one option the other option, which I honestly don't know how I feel about, is basically what Jim was suggesting, which is keep the type system, but then encode the type into the attribute for HTTP. So, for example, for an integer, it might be CE-I dash attribute name or CE-S for string. That way, we keep the type system, but we don't necessarily have to use JSON to do the encoding. We can do what may be more natural. Right? So integers appear as just straight integer, strings appear as strings without quotes, that kind of stuff. Um, I kind of view those as, as the two options in front of us. Um, I have a slight preference just going for strings because I like keeping things simple, but I'd love to hear what other people think in terms of options they either want to offer up as alternatives, or even if they say, keep what we have right now and force everybody to do the JSON encoding as we currently have in spec. What do people think? I love my suggestion, but that probably doesn't count. <laughs> no, it does. <laughs> it, it was an interesting one. I, 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 like I said, I, for me personally, I go back and forth on it. There's part of me that says it's elegant. It's, it's easy. It gives everything people need to know. The other part of me says it's a little bit odd <laughs> to have a type in there, but at least it's just a, it's a single character with a dash. It's not that big a deal, right? But you can't tell the difference between an extension I and the type. Well, we would have to require an HTTP anyway to always have a type in there. So it always have, there would always be two dashes, right? Yeah, or whatever you ended up doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was just, uh, I was just trying to move the, 
the definition of the type somewhere else. That, right. that was really my intention. Don't we have a, this problem with JSON? Can you elaborate a little? Uh, a unknown extension that is of type timestamp. How do you know that it is not just a string? The spec does not define a type called timestamp. Uh, right. What is the yeah, it's everything. A, it's timestamps a string are, with a format. Yeah. Yeah, timestamps are just strings, but the specification of that attribute says it has to be in this particular format, but it's type uh, of But let's say we encode, encode it by AMQP. Yeah. Then it will be uh, then, will, then it will be a timestamp. Uh, no, it won't be a timestamp because you don't know that it was defined as a timestamp. No, because it's an extension you haven't seen. So the 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 um, well that depends that depends which SDK world you're in. So in okay. the in the um, in the C sharp SDK, okay. I allow for I allow for um, uh, typed typed extensions. And if you use a daytime um, okay. and you use AMQP, that actually maps straight to a daytime AMQP daytime. So, so let's so imagine a system. Let's imagine a system with three components, a sender that's defined the extension, a router, which is unfamiliar with the extension, but receives the content by JSON and sends it by AMQP. Yep. And then a consumer at the end that receives the data by AMQP. So the router doesn't know about the extension, but the sender and the recipient do. Mm -hmm. So, and the sender is sending by JSON. The router sees a attribute of, a, of an extension attribute whose type it doesn't know, which has some string contents, which if parsed could be a timestamp. It now needs mm -hmm. to send the correct type onto the destination, which could be string or could be timestamp, and it doesn't know which because it, it was built before the extension was defined. Well, basically, Evan, I think what you're suggesting then is <clears throat> when all this is said and done, unless we go with everything's just a string, we may need to add a timestamp type of, a, a, yes. a timestamp type. Including to, including to JSON. JSON has this problem. Yeah, JSON, J, so, yeah, so JSON has this, has this particular problem. That's right. Is that because JSON, JSON is, has a um, pretty sucky type, type system. And URI reference has this same problem, too. Uh, probably URI, URI reference and timestamp are both strings that may yes. mean something deeper, and JSON isn't encoding the difference between string and timestamp or string and URI reference. Right. Uh, uh, I, I, I think the actual problem here is even allowing uh, you to use something transport, trans, transport specific um, data types that we don't even the spec because that does break interoperability. If you don't know about the extension, you will be why define timestamp in the spec. Well, well, I don't think we can define everything that you would have in different findings. So, in, even though even though that will make it that will make it um, um, convenient um, to make it all a string. I can I can see I can see the need um, since message selectors already came up. If we're thinking if we're thinking having a um, an AMQP, let, let me let me talk AMQP for a second. Um, if we're thinking about having an AMQP network where events are being routed uh, through multiple hops and you have you have an unknown extension um, and the the extension needs to carry a date. Um, then if you have a message selector, which wants to go and make a, a range comparison uh, around that date, well, that needs to be shown up, shown up as a date. If we say, if we say um, well, for interoperability purposes, everything needs to be a string, then you're effectively precluding in the MQP case that you can go and route um, that metadata um, so, that, so that an MQP message selector can make sense of it. So in that particular case, Clemens, if, if it's an unknown extension, 
how would AMQP know to convert it to a timestamp if it's if it's so, just an extension? So if you if you if all you do is AMQP, so that's that. So I'm I'm just for the moment that is my world. Mm -hmm. I, I start I start a create cloud event. I have an extension, and um, I send that cloud event, map it such that the uh, the cloud event that extension property shows up in the application properties. In the application properties, the value um, of that property is timestamp uh, typed. So AMQP has a has a type type system and knows timestamp. So as long as you're in the AMQP land, you will have um, you will preserve the, the type identity um, there. As soon as you break out and you go to a a lesser type system, um, where we have the problem with JSON, then you don't. Right. So, but what do you do when you when you're in a world where it it appears on the wire as a string, but it's coming into AMQP at some point, and you, and you want to do that filtering that you're talking about? Can you ever make the assumption that it's a timestamp, or do you always have to treat it as a string because you just don't know? Well, it, it may be coming over the wire using AMQP. Well, no, I meant maybe I'm <laughs> phrasing correctly. Uh, something before you, <laughs> all it yes. knows is, is is that it's a string, right? Um, when can you make the assumption that it's a timestamp or can you never? Because it seems to me that you can never assume it's a timestamp if all you know is that it's a string. I could, infer, I could infer it. Okay, because I'm, what I'm kind of wondering is whether... I can, I can do a try convert and if I can't convert it to a timestamp, then, um, then I will treat it as a timestamp. That's, that's, that's one way of doing it. Basically saying, if it's a well-formed ISO 8601 um, period, then it's a or or a date. Then it's a it's a timestamp, and otherwise, it's a string. Well, that that gets to something that I've been wondering about is whether, at the cloud event spec level, we could keep everything as a string, but then let the implementations of the spec or SDKs or whatever sits on top of the spec make those decisions for itself. Right? If it knows certain types aren't just strings let it convert it and expose it to their users as something other than strings. But at the spec cloud event level, everything can be a string. Is, is that something that's even possible or is that get too confusing because we need more, we need more clarity. But, but again, all the, if you want to take events and you want, if you want to use middleware routing expressions on them in an AMQP network or in an AMQP broker um, or you know, whatever broker that may be, um, they're always broken out into properties. Um, that's also true for the old MQP and that's true for MQ and for all the other ones. All message brokers generally have, have um, uh, type properties. Um, then having all of those as string basically means that everything, you have to go and now parse ISO 8601 uh, dates in your, in your uh, expressions and you can't do that. Okay, Evan, was your hand old or is that new? Old, I think. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I'm going to write this up in the issue anyway because okay. I think it's worth recording there. Yeah, well, I agree. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so I'm. I don't have a. So I, I have no good solution in my head. I'm like I I'm, I understand I understand the simplicity of every, of making everything a string. Yeah. At the same time, I'm I'm a, I'm worried about. Um, scenarios where you really want to go and take a look at a cloud event and all of its its custom extension properties for an application and those have um, you know promoted properties that are promoted an extension is effectively a promoted property where you have um, if you look at it from an application perspective right and you have an, you have an app the app goes and creates a payload for its its event and uh, the event is relatively complicated. And of course, what the middleware generally can't do um, because of complexity, because of compute workload, et cetera, is, is know all the potential uh, data structures, um, you know, payload structures, and sometimes it just can't crack them because there's, they are encrypted and et cetera, et cetera. So what you're doing instead, you're, you're taking some elements out of your payload and you're promoting them out to properties, which, which we call extensions, but the kind of application specific. And then if you want to go and, and have the, the middleware then do some routing rules based on those, 
then strings become much more difficult than numerals or um, 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 or dates. Like so, so filtering by numbers, partitioning by numbers, is much much easier than doing that by 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 strings. We need to do string manipulation. So string becomes a pretty unwieldy thing for um, such uh, for filtering rules. Okay, we're running a little low on time here. Uh, so let me just get Jem and Tapini, then we have to end it here. So Jem, I think you were first. So I, I agree with the assertion that you know if you put everything as a string, then you, you actually have other problems. Um, I sort of rail against any sort of in type inference going on, as, you know, um, especially if stuff is gonna move between transports, anything that might misinterpret stuff along the way sort of scares me a little, um, which sort of leads me to a horrifying statement. I, I think you need a richer type system. We need to, if we want to say we want timestamps and we want them as a first class type, and then the encoding onto the transport has to um, propagate the type specification with it. I mean, I, I don't really see any other way around that. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll yield the time. Okay. Um, Tapini, you might have to be last on this one. Yeah, yeah, really, really fast. Um, I, I do agree that the things should have been done within the elite at the binding level. You shouldn't just convert or infer everything. That sounds absolutely horrible. Um, but I do think that the transport should be able to describe its richer type system, but it should also describe how it will uh, format back those fields at the consumer side. And I will write that as a proposal in the PR. Yeah. Okay. The fun, um, thi the fun thing is that AMQP probably landed in that place where it is because of these, these things, because of these concerns, that it has its own type system. All right. Okay, with that, I think we're gonna have to stop here. And I just remembered, I forgot to search for that email from James Roper that I mentioned at the beginning of the call. So I just pasted it into the chat if you guys are interested in that. Um, but what I'd like to do first is final roll call, if I can find my mouse. Do, do, do. Hold on a minute here. Um, so please, add, yeah, guys, add your comments to the PR because I'd like to see if we can get that one resolved at some point next week. It'd be really, really nice. Um, I heard Jim. Doug, are you on, on the call? Doug? What about yes, Kathy? Here. Oh, okay, gotcha. Kathy? Yes, I'm here. Okay, I heard Evan. Victor, are you there? Victor? Victor is here with me. Victor. Oh, okay, gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Jude, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. And Vlad? I'm here. Hey. hey. And Vladimir? I'm here. Thank you. Did I miss anybody? Okay. Thank you guys very much. I apologize if we're one minute over. If you have anything to do with the demo or KubeCon presentations, please stick on the call for the next one. I appreciate that. And thank you guys very much. Everybody else is free to leave. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. See, we could just prefix the suffix to strings, but I'm not, not quite. Well, that's what, well, since you're running out of time, I was going to ask you what your opinion was of Jem's idea, this kind of a thing. W which kind of a thing? I'm highlighting on the screen right now. Basically, um, put the type into the name somehow. Yeah, that's, um, I don't like that, but I think there's a, there's, um, there are these type modifiers in um, in C sharp has them, and I think Java has them. Um, C has them, where you can go and say and modify a string by having a prefix for uh, for it, and and you say this is a long string, and then that's all Unicode, and or you leave it a normal string, and then it's all you know, regular bytes. So we could, I could, I can imagine that we. If we really say we want to have our own, I think I think having our own type system is something that's 
difficult to avoid. But if we could go and say and prefix a, a timestamp string with a T, um, that's that's one idea. But that idea is about thirty seconds old. So, <laughs> but I want to understand what's the difference though between prefixing the value with a T versus putting the T in the name. What's the difference there in your mind? Um, that you can still have um, you can still have uh, variants. Elaborate. What do you mean by variants? Meaning, meaning, if you have a, if you have your own custom, if you have your own custom properties, and uh, custom properties may have may vary by type, um, because you have a, you have a dynamic language, of sorts, and you're just passing messages, you're passing passing messages around that are being created, and once, you have a date, and then for with the same, like you have a you have a key, you, you have two attributes. Right, one is called key, the other one is called value, mm -hmm. or whatever. Right, and and do you think it's a good idea to go and write an application that way, um, to go and include the key and the value in your event because they're referring to whatever that is? Um, with the prefix, you would still have the opportunity to go and uh, put the uh, um, um, the value indicate the value type indicator inside of the the value itself. It's basically the this is the same as the there's a constructor a bit or byte in several encodings like um, I think uh, so a compete does that um, and um, I think protobuf does that too um, um, what is it called I haven't looked at Cbor but I believe Cbor also has a constructor bit or a constructor byte whether you basically have a leader, a leading byte, which indicates the type of the of of what whatever follows, and yeah. that would be a variation of that. Yeah, I think I think if we headed down that path, you'd probably run into pretty much the exact same problem that we ran into here, which is a leading byte kind of sounds almost like the the quoting of a string, which that's might, true. Yeah. So <laughs> okay. But, but if we want to have it, so that's the thing. If we want to have a, if we want to distinguish types, if we want to have type fidelity, then we'll have to go and be able to tell a string from a date. Uh, yes, that, that's why I kind of like Jim's proposal. It, 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 it's ugly in some ways, but it's also elegant in some ways to me. It was a, it was like dancing between the two worlds. But anyway, okay, uh, where am I going here? Do, 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 do. Planning doc, okay. So I'm going to guess as to which one will take less time, and let's do that one first. Um, presentations. As I mentioned on the previous call, I don't think anybody's completely done with their presentations yet. Am I correct in assuming that it's just a matter of people finding time? Is there any, is there any issue that, pe that we need to discuss relative to it, or is it just people just need to sit down and do it? Uh, for me, it's just merging the um, templates, etc. So I'm I'm not concerned from a from a content perspective all that much. Okay. Have you talked to Vlad at all? No, we haven't. Okay. Uh, just want to make sure you guys are know to talk to one another at some point. To make sure you guys blend into each other's talks or something like that. <laughs> Since yeah. you are talking together. My plan was since I'm going to be saying that hey, cloud events are here are boring. Use them. I was going to say that, and here's Clemens to tell you how not to use them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, not, that's not a bad idea. I'm going to share, I'm going to share a, um, an edit link with you on my OneDrive, and then you can um, uh, go and open that PowerPoint document and, st and paste your stuff in, and then we need to go and um, uh, you know, put the right template in. I think, Doug, did, didn't you send, you, I think he sent me the, the uh, I did. Original PowerPoint thing, yeah. yeah. So I have to yeah. go and up from my from my inbox, and then yeah. so I'll I'll put I'll format that and put that together, and I'll give Vlad the uh, the link on uh, a mail or or on uh, Slack. Okay. Yeah. 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 If, you, if you can't find the template, let me know, and I'll resend it. And when you do get that link, if you can update the presentation link here, I'd appreciate that, so that other people can take a look at it when you get a chance. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And for the record, Clemens, there's no rush with the link. I'm still. I still have to get my presentation reviewed by the CSO, so that's going to be taking a while. I do hope to have them done by Thursday or Tuesday at the earliest, but I don't want to block myself on that. 
Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. So I, I already have that stored, and um, you can. I'll, I'll send you. I'll send you that email. Uh, I'll send you that link. Perfect. Okay. Cool. All right. So Klaus and Scott. Now that Scott's back on the call, are you guys okay? Is this, is there any issue you guys are working with, or is it just a matter of finding time to fill in the the, the slide template? I have uh, copied my slides into the um, presentation you um, linked. Okay. Cool. So uh, there are two slides where I might ask for feedback next week. Uh, one about, uh, I call it guiding principles of, of cloud events. And I think one is about the new stuff in, in zero three. So. That'd be good. Okay. My, my um, plan was more of a live demo, like ID and cut. So I, I, can, I can share a script that I plan to do. Okay. Yeah, I mean, even if you don't, um, even if it's not a formal slide, I think sh outlining what you're going to do in terms of that demo, it would be really good just so other people in the working group can review it and, and comment. Yeah, I agree. I, I can um, do that. Are you guys still planning on showing the airport demo? I, I assume so. I thought that that was out on the intro. You mean in, in uh, classes <laughs> section? What, what do you mean by out on the intro? Can you elaborate? I thought the, the intro session was not going to have the demo. So where would where do you guys want to do the demo then in the, in the eighty five minute? Well, we got to do it somewhere. <laughs> it's either the deep dive or the intro, one of the two. And I thought at one point we talked about doing it in the demo because on a deep dive they thought they were going to run out of time, and the intro was maybe a better place to showcase something that's more lightweight, like like the airport demo. But it's up to you guys. Will you not have time to show the airport demo there? I mean, it's a fairly quick one. I, th I think we would. Okay. Now, Doug, I know you were talking about having somebody from Heathrow or Acros, I can't remember which one, with a short little couple minute video thing about why this matters to them. Is that still in the cards? Doug, are you able to come off mute? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's that. Uh, they're working on it. Okay. It, is that how long do you think that is? I'm hoping it's like a couple of minutes, kind of a thing. That two minutes is what I told them. Okay. So, Scott and Klaus, do you guys think you could work in that short little video to, from them, and you know, a one minute or a couple minute thing about the airport demo? Yeah, we could we could do that at the end and maybe like host a and a as the airport demo is happening. Okay. Okay. That works. Um, so uh, which one of you guys is sort of will take the lead on the airport demo? Just so I have a name to put here. Well, I don't think Klaus has been much involved in that, so I can. I can. There you go, that's how it's open, okay. <laughs> and this will also include demo from um, airport for skies. Okay, or not demo, video. Okay, cool. Okay, for the serverless working group session we have 85 minutes. Um, Scott, I believe you were gonna do a quick intro about state of serverless. Is that still on your plate? I, I really haven't been able to do anything with this document. It, it seems like it, not much has changed. And there's a couple new vendors in the, the space, but you know, we're, the, 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 the line has not moved. I would tend to agree. Um, would you like to maybe, sh uh, if you want, we can, what we can do is shorten this down to like a one slide kind of a thing whether it's you or somebody else, we can figure that out later. But mainly jump into the other stuff. Because for example, I think Christoph wanted to talk about some of his stuff. And then Jude had something he wanted to talk about. So maybe we could do just a quick one slide or one minute thing about the state of serverless. And this could just be more of the state of our working group more than anything else. But, but, but keep in mind that um, 
we don't have necessarily uh, an audience that's coming back year over year over year. You will have people who are new to this. And um, so I, th I think not every talk needs to be a Delta. True. We could make this uh, a highlight of the working group itself. Could see we how we got here. Maybe. Yeah. Well, we could also be like a five minute summary of the talk we're giving at the serverless summit. Yeah. That, that's fine too. But what I was thinking then is basically keeping a short overview, but then get into these three topics from Christoph and Jude, then get into the Q and A and poke on the community to get their feedback on where they want to go next. Does that still sound okay with you guys? Uh, so, so my concept of, like my question for serverless is a bit changed. I'm going to focus a bit more on functions rather than just like, you know, like, you know, when serverless functions are appropriate, et cetera. I think that's fine. Yeah, because serverless as a concept is, is too large uh, to, to give an opinion, like a blind opinion on. So, okay. But, you know, functions are, are well, well, I don't know, but yeah. Okay, well, it's kind of, the, you, you would ask for some time to, to talk about this stuff, so it's kind of up to you to decide what you want to talk about here. I, I'm looking at, at Christoph's stuff and your stuff as uh, a combination of things. One is a little bit educational based upon, you know, the topic you want to sort of share with the group but then also as a lead in to get some thought processes going inside the, the audience members so they could so they could have something to talk about during the bird of a feather session, right? Whether it's direct questions of what you talked about or whether it just sparks some ideas on what in the serverless or function space they want us to look at is kind of up to them. Yeah. So I think almost anything you want to talk about there in my mind is fine. Um, now, I do have a presentation here that's completely empty as you can see. What I'd like to do is I'll later today, I'll just create placeholder sections for you and Christoph. Um, and I guess for the uh, state of our working group kind of, or overview of our working group kind of thing. But then I'll, and I'll send out a note when that's ready, but then I'd like for you guys, if nothing else, to think about the list of leading questions for the BOF session that we can ask the community. Um, Cause obviously the big one is where would you like us to go? But, that's just one question. So think about other types of questions that you'd like to use as prompts for the, to get a discussion going with the community members. Okay. And then we're going to add those questions to the slide deck. Yeah. Okay. And that's for everybody on the call, not just obviously Jude. Um, okay. Now in terms of the presentation for the service summit, it, the presentation is there. There are some slides, but I don't think it's complete yet. Um, let's see how he is not on the call. Uh, Javier, and I have, Javier and I have, have had some brief back and forth a little, um, but I'm going to poke on him to make sure his stuff is done next week as well. So what I'd like to do is remind everybody that try to get your stuff done by Wednesday of next week so that by Thursday we can tell everybody in the working group to look at the slides, review them, and get their comments in because because uh, obviously KubeCon is the week after. Okay, so shoot for Wednesday at the latest to get your slides into all your decks. All right, anything else relative to presentation and stuff we need to talk about? Does everybody feel comfortable with what they're working on and the flows for their presentations that they're involved in? Uh, what about the serverless days thing? Or sorry, the uh, day zero. Did we already talk about that? Did I miss it? You meant that, the one I was just uh, talking yes. about? Okay. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I understand, Scott. You don't listen to me. I get that. Uh, <laughs> I, I swing heavily between too much and not enough coffee. I get that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will not be there for the serverless day, for the day zero because uh, um, so I will only be arriving in the afternoon of that day on, on Monday. That's fine. I, it's only, what is this? It's like it, right now it's scheduled for 45 minutes, but uh, Alex has actually asked for a little bit of time shift. So I think it's, I think we're going to have less than 45 minutes. I think it's going to be closer to like 35. Um, yeah. So I, I don't expect it to be a whole lot. This is just a summary of everything you guys already know. What have we done in serverless? Yeah, it's not a big deal. And then you can right. join three hours of K Native in the afternoon. Yeah, it's that's be exciting. <laughs> All right, um, last chance. Anything relative to the summit itself or the uh, KubeCon itself or presentations? All right, let's switch over then to the demo. Um, Clement, since you're in the call, is Microsoft going to participate? 
I, I will I will try my best to um, um, still do something. Okay. Um, and I will be I will be the one uh, coding because the team is uh, loaded. Okay. All right. In that case, anybody else on the call have some questions or comments? I know Owen. I think you said you might have had a couple. Um, yeah. So I haven't really been involved much up till now. I was able to join this call only once in the past. So mm -hmm. I was just hoping for kind of like a fifty thousand foot quick overview of like where the integration points are and kind of what that looks like. Okay. Um, tell you what, since that's a very basic question and not, it, it's a good one, but it's a very basic question. We can do it offline too. If yeah. Right. Well, I, what I was going to say is I have a feeling the calls can end really, really quickly. So then you and I can stay online and I can walk you through it. How's that? Great. Okay. Cause I don't want to take up time for other people who, who, who already know that stuff. So aside from the basic question that Owens was asking, are there other issues, questions, concerns people have about the demo itself, or is it just a matter of finding time to code it up or test it? Scott, are you okay? Uh, I'm sorry, my, my headphones cut out. What was the question? <laughs> are you okay with the demo or is there anything you want to discuss? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> so I, I've got it working um, with the new ID types and all this stuff. I do suffer from a slight cold start crash and then come back thing. Oh, that's right. But, how, much uh, time you know, do you, how much time do you need? I know you asked me to increase that and I apologize. I forgot to increase it. How much time do you need? I, I, so I need about 42 seconds because of oh my God. the jumps I do. <laughs> 42 seconds. That's a lot. Um, but it's, it's compounded uh, cold starts. Yeah. Are you, are you booting the entire universe? <laughs> yeah. Well, so I mean, let me ask it's, it's four, four or five layers of functions that react to things. So that's, that's what I'm paying. So wow. let me ask you this. So Scott, for the KubeCon demo purposes itself, would it pain you too much if you set min scale to one? It, um, I mean, I, I could do that, but uh, it also recovers. So it's fine. Well, it is, but it makes the demo look kind of funky, right? Because your 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 thing goes away, and I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I go out of business for one person that whole line, and then I come back, yeah. and then we're good. And, yeah, and that, well, it depends, right? It, it depends on if that's what you want to showcase. <laughs> and shift. <laughs> um, okay, well, let, let's let's talk about this one offline because forty-five seconds takes, is an awful long time. Um, I'm glad we have a community of no judgment and uh, safe space. <laughs> it just, well, it's just funny because I, I, I've, I've given K-Native demos or, and meetups and stuff like that. And uh, there's a period of time when I have to wait like 25 seconds for the bill to happen. And, it, and in, that is the longest 25 seconds of my life because not only do I have to ramble, but then I have to sit there and watch this thing and pray to God that it actually works. Because you know, after 20 seconds, you never know for sure what's going on unless you actually have some monitor up. <laughs> and it's a very scary thing. And 45 seconds, just it's even worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that could change in 06 because we are removing Istio. So the cold start latency is gonna move down to four seconds. And so aggregate like 25 seconds. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let's talk about this offline because, like I said, it, I, I personally don't think it'd be horrible if we kind of fudged it a little just for the live demo to set min, min scale to one. But yeah. we can talk about that. So on a on a related or unrelated topic, I, I think it might be interesting to have a, kind of a picture of what transports are in operation in the demo from all the people that are participating. Like the the central hub is all AMQP, right? But all of my stuff actually operates off of uh, HTTP and sends back out a QP. Wait, uh, what are you envisioning relative to change of the demo? Are you, um... well, like the, that, that would be hard today, right? I, I write my function and I'm, because I'm using the cloud events SDK, I don't have to change how, I only have to switch out the transport uh, when I'm testing. So I can run it locally and I can point it at a transport that's using AMQP bindings. I can switch it out in production to the HTTP transport and it still works the exact same way. And I don't change code, I just change the setup 
of uh, how the function starts up. I okay. agree. So is that something that you'd like to incorporate into the demo? Because that sounds a little bit more like something that might be worthy of, of a discussion point as you talk about the demo. It, it could be, yeah. Because yeah. I was because I was thinking is maybe what you could do is put together a slide or two that maybe one slide that just says you know what the demo is about, do the demo and then as a follow up after the demo, talk about in one or two slides whatever you want the, about the implementation aspects like you're referring to here. Yeah, but I mean so if every integrator also has their own transport that they're picking, like if someone comes in with bridging AMQP to Kafka operates on Kafka and then sends back out to the bus. That, that's interesting. Like it's non-trivial to do that today. Yeah. I think, I think if you were to put together a slide or two with some of the, some of your thoughts around what you do, that might uh, cause other people who are doing the demo to think about things that they may want to add to the slide deck as well. Okay. Um, I just noticed something. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh, yes. Which is <laughs> which is um, which is a little sad uh, because Rab <laughs> RabbitMQ is doing AMQP, but it's not doing the right version of AMQP. Yeah, well, we're using I told them. Oh, do we do we know that? Yes, I I told them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we oh wait a minute. O one or sorry yeah. one o. But we're can we also, change it? Oh, yeah. Can we change it to one o? Isn't that okay now? Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah, yeah, okay. So if you're using one O, then that's good. Don't okay. Don't freak us out, Clemens. But we don't <laughs> no, no. Have our strings, so we won't work with Clemens. Whoops. No, no, no. But it's uh, that that is the thing that uh, um, like our AMQP binding is not assuming that there's zero point nine. It's assuming one point yeah, Okay. You should be good. There's this okay, adapter for. Yes. Yeah, I understand that, but it's uh, it's. Like that's not the thing that you people use by default. So great that we do that. Yeah, I, uh, uh, Klaus got us set straight on that a couple, about a week or two ago. Fantastic. I was. That's when I was when I was away. Yeah. Okay. I was just. I was just. A, this. This. Uh, it caught my eye. I'm like, oh god. Okay, but I'm okay. Great. <laughs> yeah, it caused a little bit of pain for us, but we we got through it. Good. So, yeah. All right. Any other. Questions, comments? So, actually, so Klaus, are, are you going to do an implementation? Yeah, we'll try to. <laughs> so okay. we, we have for our functions implementation an MQP trigger anyway. So that's what I will try to use. Cool. Yeah, because I, I would love to have used um, the AMQP uh, K-native event source. Is that is that ready? Are, are you using that, Scott? I, I wrote my own. Okay. Yeah, because I kind of I would like to see one. Because <laughs> I kind of I did my own thing under the covers as well, just because it was well, easiest. So I have I have a repository that um, implemented an AMQP source and sync. So you can you can host it and then you can bridge events onto the broker, operate on stuff, and then send it back out on the sync or on the yeah on the sync. The sync takes in events from inside the cluster and pushes them back out to a the predetermined transport. Is this something you're going to contribute back to, to Knative at some point? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I have a bigger plan um, using the Go the Go SDK and all the transports and all the the I wrote something called a I call a bridge that bridges two transports together, and so it's a it's a it's two. Uh, cloud event clients that's listening on two separate transports and then just shuffling data between them. And it might actually be a pretty interesting uh, first class K native component that does those bridges. I would be very excited about that one. Sounds interesting. Yeah, and, and then, uh, you know, like more and more transports becomes very important for the cloud events SDK for, for Golang because now you get to support every permutation of those two uh, of every transport which is really yeah. cool. That's interesting. Cool. Okay. I, I can share a link to that code. It's, it's open. It's not yeah. in native yet. Yeah, please do. Okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Uh, comments. 
Correct. As the as the uh, MPP TC co-chair, I am uh, really, really, really excited that all of a sudden, without me pushing all that hard, MPP becomes so popular here. That, I like that a lot. Uh, who, who said it was popular? I wouldn't say popular. <laughs> <laughs> We're using it. It's because it's something that you're that you're that you're accommodating it. I I really like. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, who do we get to blame for that? Who I can't remember who was this that suggested uh, RabbitMQ? Was it? Was it you, Jude, or, or Vlad? I can't remember who it was. I think it was me. Yeah, I think it was you. So we get to either blame you or thank you, one of the two. <laughs> yeah. Active, you, you should be a big fan of ActiveMQ Artemis because that's actually a good broker. I've never used it, but I've used Kafka. And what? Else, actually. No. Artemis, yeah. Probably, yeah. Uh, probably ActiveMQ, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's like, like you should, when, when you're looking for an open source broker to use with AMQP, ActiveMQ Artemis is the choice. It's really good. Interesting. Cool. I used ActiveMQ. Is that, is that wrong? That's, no, that's just the older version and the older code base. And uh, the, the new Artemis is based off uh, of uh, HornetQ, which was an acquisition by Red Hat. And that's uh, just faster and more modern. And that's where they... Where the, most of the work goes, but yeah, active from an interface perspective is the same thing. So one thing that I uh, forgot that we should probably talk about <clears throat> is I know Scott and I are both implementing all the various roles, but in reality, for the demo itself, I well, I guess it depends on how many people we actually get signed up. I was assuming that <laughs> you don't want everybody doing everything; otherwise, it's going to get very, very crowded. I guess we can wait. We don't have to decide right now. Um, but at some point, we may need to to assign people different roles, just so the screen isn't too busy. Because um, we were kind of assign, assuming oh, assign sorry. me something. Well, um, by Slack. Be, well, we can make. Um, I was thinking either a supplier or a carrier. Um, okay. They can make Microsoft a carrier, but I, 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 but well, okay. Once you start off doing a carrier, um, I, then we'll hold off on the rest because I think it depends on how many other people other people join. Okay. Um, but at least that will give you at least one to start with because that that's the bare minimum. Okay. 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 Any other questions or comments? All right. Cool, thank you guys. In that case, everybody's free to go except for Owen, unless anybody wants to hang on the call and talk to Owen about his questions. All right. Otherwise, thanks guys, we'll talk to you next week. Bye. All right. All right. Owen. Would let's... you like me to stay, Doug? That's completely up to you. You can correct me where I get things wrong if you want. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so Owen. Um, <clears throat> How much of the demo do you know, or should I start with you know nothing? Um, like I said, I was able to join this call once before, so I know I know a bit. Um, but okay, well, I'll tell you what, I'll start from the very beginning. It's, it's not it's not huge. So basically, oh, there we go. Scott's doing something. <clears throat> so basically, the the point of the demo is simulating a airport environment where there's retailers. That's these guys down here. And they are going to sell coffee to customers. And there's the wonderful cold start kicking them out. Um, so we have retailers down here selling coffee. We have suppliers up here who are offering up coffee cups. Um, so as the retailers run out, they will send out an event saying, hey, I need more coffee cups. Uh, suppliers will say, OK, I, uh, I have a coffee shipment or coffee cup shipment ready to get picked up. Um, the carriers, the little trucks over here, will then go to the various suppliers, carry them to the retailers, and then go back home. Okay, so that's the basic flow. The audience members are supposed to participate because what we're going to do is tell them to go to sourcedog.com slash airport, and they should see on their phone this little thing down here that I see in the corner. So, for example, they'll be able to pick a coffee shop, so IBM Coffee, and the little guy will walk up to it, and they can hit the little jump button, and the guy will jump and stuff like that. Then they can order their coffee, so small in this case, and then they'll walk away when they have it. If the guy, if the retailer runs out of coffee, he'll ask for more, as I said, but then he'll also put up that little bubble where small appears here, medium appears here, large appears here, indicating that he's out of coffee cups. So that's gives you an indication of something that's going on. But I mean, that's the basic flow from a visual perspective. Okay, now 
the way it works under the covers is everything that goes on here is event driven. So we have a single RabbitMQ uh, deployment that's receiving and sending out events for everything. Okay. And what you see on the right hand side here are basically the cloud events that flow back and forth to the system. So let's actually pick one that might be more interesting. So here, so in this particular case, um, when somebody places an order, this is the cloud event that gets sent. Uh, in this particular case, the passenger is technically sending the event. We know it's an order because it's order released. And it's going to be going to the retailer called retailer.ibmr, which just happens to be the first retailer down here on the left hand side. And he's going to process it. When he's done, he'll send out an event saying the, the, um, the coffee's been delivered. And the controller, which is basically the, the graphical stuff here, watches for all the events and makes things move on the screen accordingly. OK? Got it. So the event, OK, the demo itself. So basically, if you look at the document itself, in case you don't have it, here's a link. I do. Oh, you do. OK, good. If you basically look at the event flow in this section, just walk through it and you'll see all the various events that can flow uh, through the system just once walking through it. And so what you'll see is initially uh, all the various participants will register. So let's get the reset here for a sec. Let's talk down here to a register, right? So the first thing is, for example, a retailer registers and you can see what the event looks like here. Um, not, not too exciting. Um, you just register your system. You have a system name and an organization. The system name is sort of like the machine readable name. That's the name that's going to appear in all the events. And that's the thing you're going to look for to know whether this event is basically for you. This is the human readable name. And that really only appears. Uh, uh, it doesn't actually appear. It does. Oh, no, it, it appears here. Um, but the, re the, re the real name for retailers and trucks, I don't think they ever appear anywhere. The, the logo does though, right? So you get the little icon here and the icon here. Those will appear because of this logo URL right here. Okay? So once you as a retailer, supplier, or carrier register, what's then going to happen is at some point later in the, on, the controller will reallocate who's doing what. That way everybody gets a fair shake in the demo itself, right? So when you register, you don't say, I do small cups for this particular retailer the controller will tell you what you're supposed to do. And so it's very important that as these events that we're talking about here flow around, you react to them appropriately and immediately. Uh, because as new retailers come on board, we don't want two retailers trying to supply cups for the same retailer. That's gonna cause the system to get into a really weird state. Okay, so what will happen is, in this particular case for a supplier, you'll get a, uh, a data section that says for this particular retailer, here are the coffee cup sizes you support, or you'll, you'll, yeah, you'll send out boxes for. Um, you will get the complete list of all retailers that you support. So this chunk right here could technically be or replicated based upon uh, how many retailers you're going to be supplying. So you can assume that anytime you get this event, it will be the complete list. It's not like you're going to get three events and you have to sort of merge them together because otherwise you can't tell whether it's, you know, you have to merge them together or it's a brand new start of a list. So we just said, nope, you're gonna get one event with everything you're supposed to be working on. So if you get a second event of that type, wipe out your memory about what's going on and start from fresh. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so here's the message for the supplier. Here's the message for a carrier, same type of thing. You'll get an array of to and from locations and that's who you're gonna be supplying for. Um, let's see, when everything is done, the controller sent out a message saying that the uh, passenger has placed an order and this is actually destined for a particular retailer. So this is one of those cases where it's a event that is technically targeted. So it's not really eventing per se, it's more messaging, but such is life. We needed some way for the controller to say this, this passenger uh, ordered something. But then from then on, I think most everything else is kind of eventing for the most part. And you can kind of see the flow here. So the passenger placed an order, retailer delivered the coffee cup. So this is messes is actually technically for the controller more than anything else. So you can tell the little passenger guy to walk away. Um, the retailer can also indicate uh, his new inventory level. Technically these are ignored except um, 
No, actually, yeah, um, technically these are ignored except when it's zero. Um, because at, when it's zero, that's when the controller will put up that little bubble up here to, to know, for example, that uh, he's out of small coffee cups. Let's see if I can make him do it. Here we go. Yeah, there you go. So when, the, when an event is sent with an inventory level of zero, that's how the controller knows that he's out of coffee. And that's when the um, bubble appears. Okay. The big one that you want to watch for, or the big one you want to do if you're going to end up doing a retailer, is this one order released. So that's your way of telling the supplier you're out of coffee, and in particular, you're out of small cups. And notice you don't say what supplier is going to be supplying you. That's for the supplier to, to pick up the events and recognize that, oh, this retailer is out of small cups. That's what the controller told me to do. I'm going to react to it. So the way the supplier will react to it is he's going to send out a notification saying he has um, a box that needs to get picked up. So potential action status means I need something to get picked up and shipped uh, from IBM S supplier to IBM R retailer and you just happen to be doing small coffee cups even though I don't think that's really used any place. So the supplier sends out this one. The transport or the carrier is going to react to it. The carrier is going to notice that it's the from and to locations that he supports, and he's going to react to that. And he's going to send out a notification saying, okay, action status is now, or it's now active action status. So he's basically saying, yep, I'm going to pick up that box. That's the signal for the, the controller to change the, uh, the screen so that he sends a little truck on its way, right, to the supplier. So the truck will go from here up to the supplier, down to the retailer, and then back home when he's done. Okay, so that's, that's the important message for the controller to know what's going on. So then eventually the controller is going to tell the UI uh, that his truck has actually moved to the retailer. So because uh, the, the, technically in the real world, right, the truck will tell the retailer, I'm sorry, the truck will tell the, uh, the carrier when he's arrived. But because the UI is in control of things, we've, we've made the controller do this. So the controller is basically telling the carrier, yep, your truck has arrived. So now the carrier can send a notification saying action completed. Okay. I don't sure anything really happens here other than um, it's just sort of letting the system know that everything's there. Oh, I guess that is, that's a notification for the, uh, the retailer to know that the packages have been delivered. So now the retailer can increase his inventory level to two. And so he sent that notification just so the world can know who's ever watching that he now has two cups and he's ready to go and, and can service more customers. Uh, the current process we have right now, I think, is that everybody assumes that there's two cups per box, even though it's a very small level. If you increase it, you don't necessarily get trucks flying around the screen as often as we may want. Um, sure. But that's just, you know, obviously something we could easily change. Um, anyway, I ran a little off there. Let me pause and see where you have questions. Um, okay. No, that, I think that all, that all makes sense at a high level. Okay. Um, so is... As far as like the different implementations all kind of working together, um, is that all just via RabbitMQ? Like everybody's just um, yeah, yeah ba basically that and publishing that. Yeah, basically everybody works and communicates through RabbitMQ. Uh, you determine what you do based upon the MQ message, RabbitMQ message you get, and you based upon the triggers you see. So, for example, you know here's the no, that's not a good one. Um, yeah, so here, as a retailer, these are the things you look for inside the actual event to know whether it's meant for you or not and whether you need to react to it. And yeah, and then when you're done, if you need to notify somebody something going on, yep, you send another RabbitMQ message back up. Everything goes through RabbitMQ. So you technically don't even need an external endpoint um, as long as you can reach the RabbitMQ server. Got it. Okay, so if I'm implementing this you know, as a serverless thing on my end that I need to be able to um, trigger my functions and stuff from RabbitMQ messages. Yeah, you'll need something that pulls events off of the RabbitMQ queue, if that's the right word, and passes it on to your function, yes. Cool, okay. that makes sense. Um, and then as far as uh, like testing, is there any kind of recommended story for that? Or just um, the version that's up? No, uh, other than just connect up to it and see what blows up. Um, the, one thing I, 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 the one thing I forgot to mention is if you get a reset message, 
which is not targeted in one person, just an event of type reset. If you see that, completely reset your environment. Um, you should actually get a, you should also actually see a disconnect message, okay? But the point of the reset message is people uh, have, have been experimenting with stuff and they may, for example, do their own testing, add other roles, right? Add, add other retailers, suppliers or whatever. And there have been times when we get into a really bad state because people send messages when they shouldn't have, okay? And we needed a way to tell everybody, look, not blaming anybody, but something went wrong, reset everything. And so the best thing for you to do is when you see the reset message or a disconnect message is basically just reset your environment, forget about everything you know, and re-register. Actually, I, I, actually, I'm sorry, I take that back. You should not respond to a reset. I mean, th I, let me think about that. Now, I'm, the reason I'm pausing is I'm trying to remember, because I know when the controller sees a reset, he will send out a disconnect to everybody. Um, So it may be better if you do both. <laughs> if you see a reset or you see a disconnect, you may want to just reset everything either way. It doesn't do any harm to do it twice, right? So basically, sure. um, at that point, if you see a reset or a disconnect, go ahead and forget about what you were supposed to be doing from the controller's perspective, and then go ahead and re-register with the system, and you'll get automatically re-added, and, and job assignments will get dished out accordingly. I'll have to go back and double check on the code, but I'm pretty sure if you've reacted both of them, you're okay. And uh, is registering that important effectively? Um, I believe so. I'll double here. Actually, I can, I can test it right now. Hold on. Let me go back to my screen. Let me. Uh, do, 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 do. Let's see. Oops. Hold on. Let me add another retailer and see what happens if I try to add him twice. So there's another retailer I just added. And let me add him again with the exact same name. Okay, so nothing happened. Yeah, so you can see here's the retailer that I added, R1. And then if I click the first one. You can see he added again, same R1. <clears throat> so the controller does do some checking on that. And he won't put duplicates in there. So yes, it is item important. Cool, okay. Yeah, so it seems like there definitely should be no problem with um, watching for both reset and disconnect then. Yeah, that should be okay. I think you're good. Let me go ahead and kill him and watch everything adjust. There you go, cool. All right, uh, let's see. Any, uh, next question. Um, I think I have... Uh, a handle on the uh, on the basics, at least. I'm sure I'll have more questions as I kind of get into the actual implementation. But yeah, are you in the Slack channel? Yeah, I just got in it, so just, I can okay, ask cool. questions there. Okay, yeah. Uh, obviously, please do not hesitate because the last thing I want to have happen is you feel like you're rushing at the last minute to get this stuff done. So um, most most of us are hanging out there. So if you have a question, just paste your question onto the Slack, and we'll get an answer to you as soon as we can. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks for taking the time to kind of walk me through all of this. Sure. Not a problem. Okay. Um, Doug, I see you're still on the call. Is there anything you want to mention or anything I forgot? Anything you want to bring up? Nope. Oh. Okay. Oh. Sorry. I, no, not <laughs> it, um, I, think, I think the demo, the dashboard looks great. You know, I, I mean, it, uh, when you start getting traffic, going through there, you see how it all orchestrates. It's uh, pretty cool. Yeah, have you seen it when Scott does his test client and he bombards the system with customers? Yeah, no, I, 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 I saw it at the beginning. Yeah. yeah it, it was really cool. Yeah, it's, it's really kind of scary because we started doing some really weird stuff for a while there, but I think it's a good test of the system, especially when we, um, when we start having the audience involved in there because you can get 100 people signed up for this thing. I'm glad that he did that, that test client. It's a good little testing for us. Yeah. I'm excited to see how it all ends up. I mean, I hope uh, I hope you have a few more participating that were on this call. So that would yeah, be good. I, I expect we'll get at least. I think I think Clements will come through. 
Um, I think Jude will have something. I think Klaus will have something. And I expect at least one or two other people to show up at the last minute in a panic. So I, I think I think we'll be good. I think we'll have, I think we get good participation. All right. All right. Uh, anything else you guys want to talk about? Nothing for me. All right. Cool. In that case, I think we're done. And uh, thanks. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye.